got two right. turns. We shall see. Let's turn then to Second Peter, and I think we're going to cover the first four verses tonight. We, we've preached through First Peter, and now we move in to his second epistle. You remember that these are written by the Apostle, probably around AD 60, at a time when the church is experiencing persecution. First Peter, in particular, would seek to equip the church for that persecution. Second Peter seems to come in from a slightly different angle, still the same time, but it has three things to teach us. Chapter 1, the importance of a godly life. Chapter 2, how to handle those who distort the word of God and bring false teaching. And in chapter 3, the importance of having before us all the time the fact that the Lord's coming back. It would appear that even way back then some people were being sceptical. But these things are in the three chapters. We're just going to dip our toe, if you want, into chapter 1, where Peter introduces himself and then gives us this marvellous picture of what God has provided for us in Jesus Christ before going on to describe how it should work in our lives. As usual, we want to just have a, a skim through the book to see who is writing to us. And so in verse 1, it's very quickly made apparent that the author is Simon Peter. He's a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. You'll find at the beginning of chapter 3 that he's the same Peter that wrote first Peter. It says, Be Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. That links him or identifies him as the Peter that wrote the first one. If you cast your eye down to verse um, 17, isn't it, and verse 18, you'll see that he was also the Peter who was on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he talks about having been an eyewitness of Jesus' majesty, in verse 16 and then he tells us what that was he heard the voice this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased he's that same man of God and it's important to lay hold of these things our Bible was put together on those principles when it was decided in the fourth century to finally make a definitive Bible they didn't just scratch their head and make some guesses. What they did was they, they looked back through history and they determined which books had always been received as apostolic, as coming from the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, etc. And if a book didn't have that marker immediately, there was a great deal of discussion. One of the books that was nearly not in our New Testament was the book of Hebrews because it doesn't introduce who the writer is at the beginning. And even to this day, you'll find people debating about who actually wrote Hebrews. Historically, many folks think it was the Apostle Paul, but it's not my business to preach on the, the origin of Hebrews tonight. Second Peter was also a letter that took a lot of investigation, but it's because of things like verse one and the other details in the, the book that it was finally decided that this book should be included. And I'm glad it was, because it has in fact been a great help to us as Christians. I've mentioned the three things that they were seeking to, to deal with. The fact that Christians need to know who they are, whose they are, and what provision God has made for us. You get that in the first 11 verses of this chapter but there's just too much information and detail there for us to go into it these 11 verses after the introduction are a call to the reader to the christian to make growing spiritually their own business in the last chapter verse chapter three he'll talk about growing in grace and he reminds us that when you become a Christian, it's the beginning of a process that takes the rest of your life and is not ultimately finished until you meet the Lord. Whether that be through your own personal call into his presence, 
or whether that be when he arrives in glory and splendor to receive all those who are alive. Peter is writing then to stir up these Christians so they have a sure foundation before he goes on to talk about the false teachers in chapter 2 and the false teaching in chapter 3. And that's a good place to, for us to begin as Christians. There are many things we could discuss and get involved in thinking about and probably should get involved in thinking about. But it, it must always be from this sure foundation. Not the sinking sand, as Jesus called it, but the solid rock. So that when the storm comes, we're not left thinking, what will I believe and what don't I believe? We know the truth that was once and for all delivered to the saints. That phrase comes from the book of Jude. And one of the interesting things about the book of Jude is it contains many of the exact same verses as first as Second Peter. God has actually put it together in such a way to make sure that you and I recognise the difference between the clouds without water, as Jude calls them, and the beautiful, wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. There are three subdivisions here. After his introduction in verses 1 and 2, and we'll look at them, he goes on then to talk about the means that are provided by God for growth. He describes the aim of that growth in verses 5 through 9. And then in verses 10 and 11, he gives us the ultimate goal of that growth. So that we might have an entrance supplied abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We want to then begin right at the beginning of this letter with Peter's greeting or salutation. I've used the verse already to establish who the author is, but there are one or two important points in that very first verse which we should not fly past. Notice particularly that he calls himself Simon Peter. There's only one other place in the Bible that that happens. Back in Acts chapter 15. What's the significance? Well, Simon would be the name he would be given at birth by his parents. That's who he is naturally, if you would say. Where did the name Peter come from? That was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. So in saying Simon Peter, he's, he's emphasizing his roots and his experience of the grace of God. He's a changed man. Because he met Jesus Christ. I was reading this afternoon. Andrew went and looked for Peter. And brought him to the Lord Jesus. And that's where he's given the name. And then that passage in Matthew 16. Where the Lord tells him. Because of his confession of faith. That he's going to build his church. On that confession. And because of that. His name will be Peter. Or the rock. So Simon Peter begins by bringing us. Immediately into the realm. Of the fact that we are talking or we are listening at this point to a man who has been saved by grace and set apart for the gospel. How do I know that? He calls himself a bond servant. If you know your Bible, you'll understand the significance of that word bond servant. You need to go right back into the book of Deuteronomy and to recognize back there that if you got into debt, you didn't borrow from the bank, but what you did was you, you borrowed from somebody who had the resources. And then to pay them back, you worked for them. You were a servant and you could work for up to seven or eight years to pay back what you owed. At the end of that period, you had the choice to leave or to stay. And if you found your circumstances to be better working for this master and you chose to stay, you became a bond servant. And they had a very interesting symbolism attached to it. What they would do, they would take you to the front door of the house, to the doorpost, and then they would put a, a, an awl, A-W-L, through your ear and into the doorpost. You were attached to the house. Now, us men don't usually get our ears pierced. Ladies do, don't they? They know something of that pain, and I'm glad it was never something I was either expected to or encouraged to get done. 
But that's what a bond servant is. It's a servant who is willingly given over to the pleasure of his master. And so Peter tells us, I'm Simon Peter. I'm the one when the little girl asked me if I was Jesus' disciples, I cursed and swore. I'm the one who when the soldier and then the woman asked me, I just went mad. I was a man who had been privileged by Christ. I denied him. But then by grace I was restored. And having been restored, I am now committed to serving him for the rest of my natural life. That's Simon Peter the bond servant, but it doesn't stop there. You'll notice that it then goes on to say he's an apostle. Again, words like apostle often just go straight over our heads because we're familiar with reading them. I mean, it's only the beginning of the letter. Put the brakes on. Apostle has a significance which is very important. It means somebody who's sent with a commission. It means somebody who is not representing themselves, but has been set apart to represent a higher authority. In modern parlance, it would be somebody like an ambassador. Paul calls himself elsewhere, doesn't he? An ambassador for Christ. And what they're doing is they're working with that, the, the, the meaning of these words so that you and I understand you're listening to a man or you're reading a man who, having been born naturally through contact with Christ, was transformed and he is now a willing servant. He loves being Jesus' servant and he's also got a message for us. And that message is not just his own opinion or his own ideas. That message is the one that God has given him. I don't know if you noticed in verse 16, very important statement. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's the we? He's talking about the other apostles. You remember the Lord called them to himself and he set them apart as the twelve uh, Judas turned into a traitor and he was then replaced by the Apostle Paul who calls himself one born out of due season and you have this group of 12 men who have had personal contact with Christ and are now set apart to make the word of God known to the world around them. So who's he writing to? In 1 Peter he told us it was the people in Bithynia wasn't it? The northern coast of Turkey in modern times. We don't get that kind of a description here. But we do get a very important description of his audience. One which makes this letter applicable even today to us. Because we're not just applying something that was meant for somebody else. What you have here is an address of the recipient which means that whoever you and I are, it applies to us. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There's a marvellous amount of information in this verse. Notice, first of all, he's talking about people who have obtained. The word and the tense of the word tells us this was not something they worked for. It was something which was given as a gift. In actual fact, it's a word which links back into the Old Testament idea of the Urim and the Thummim. If you remember, the priest had them in his breastplate. And when they needed to consult God and see what his will was on a certain subject, the priest would cast them on his lap. People have tried to work out what they looked like, but we don't actually accurately know. But we do know that they could be positive or negative. And then what happened was the, the positive decision or the negative one was then seen coming from the Lord. Solomon includes a, an allusion to it in uh, Proverbs 16, I think it's verse 31. The lot falls into the lap or is cast into the lap, but the whole outworking of it is of the Lord. And by using this word here, what you have then is an immediate link into this concept that these people to whom Peter is writing have the same kind of faith as him, 
because God has given it. And that's a very important biblical principle, isn't it? By grace you have been saved. Do you know how to finish? Ephesians 2 8. Notice, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You've been saved. It was something that God did to you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But how did you receive it? Through faith, which is the gift of God. And that's exactly who Peter is talking to. Every Christian, although the actual moment by moment details of it will differ from individual to individual, it has certain basic characteristics. And those characteristics include being aware there is a God, being aware that you're a sinner, being aware that Christ died for sinners, and hearing his call so that you cast yourself on his mercy, you trust him. And you're saved because the grace of God has been working in your life. You, you've been given the gift of faith and now you're a believer. And so when Peter writes, he's writing to everyone who ever becomes a Christian. It reminds me, we're not Christians by birth because we, we're born in England or Great Britain. We're Christians because of the grace of God. And then you might begin to ask, so why does he say like precious faith? Again, the word's quite helpful when you study it. It would be possible if Peter walked in the room, wouldn't it? To be overwhelmed by who he was. To be in a sort of a, a mental state where you would think, oh, he's far higher up the scale of being a Christian than I am. And that still happens in some places, does it not? It's not as common as it used to be, but when you're a minister, and some people hear that you're a minister, there's an immediate change in their, 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 their base, the way they react to you or respond to you. Peter wants to make sure that while people might do that, it's completely unnecessary and it's not part of God's design. He says, who have obtained like precious faith with us. Who's the us? Context which suggests the apostles, because he's told us he's an apostle. And the context which suggests then that what he's saying is that everybody who is a Christian is a Christian on the same basis. They have the same relationship with God through Christ, saving faith, which has delivered them from sin and judgment because Christ died for them. They're resting in his finished work and they're looking forward to meeting him. It is true that our faith is like a muscle and it needs to be exercised. And so some people are, 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 are how can I put it, bolder in the matter of faith. They, they will do things for God which maybe you and I would be less, less inclined to. But remember Jesus says, even faith like a mustard seed. The tiniest faith. That's what it takes to be a Christian. And so Peter is saying, who have like precious faith. I was reading again this afternoon and I found something I hadn't seen the other day. And, and that was that this was a term which was used in the first century for individuals who were not part of the Roman Empire by birth, but came into the Roman Empire and wanted to become citizens. Once they had gone through the various instructions and tested, they became citizens equal to every other citizen. And so you have it there. How does it come about though? Where does it come from? By the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That little phrase is again profoundly important. Peter, God's servant, Jesus' messenger, is a believer like you and I. And how do we become believers? Well, I've described it in part already. It's it's through the gift of faith that God gives us. But how is it possible for God to make sinners acceptable to himself? It's because Jesus Christ was righteous. And as the one who is righteous never sinned, he went to the cross at Calvary. He experienced a death he didn't deserve and made himself an offering, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He is righteous. His offering was different to every other offering. It was perfect. Over and over we're told that. And because 
His offering was accepted. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, isn't it? Became sin for us, took our place. You know how to finish that verse? That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It's right there before you. One final thing before I leave this introduction. And that is the little phrase, our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This is one of the important New Testament texts which establish for us that Jesus is God. We live in a day and an age when many skeptics refuse it. The cults are on our street and they'll, they'll get into a boxing match about it. But you've just got to go back to the word of our God and Saviour. In Greek, the word and has the, the, the emphasis of even. So it's and even. It's talking about the same person. Our God and even our Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's very important, isn't it? When Jesus, the perfect one, made atonement on that cross, he was much more than a man. If he had been a man, he could have been a substitute for one person. But because he is God, there is infinite value in his offering. And he therefore is the saviour of all men. As many as will come to him. What a beautiful two verses just to get into your mind. Look at them. Drink deep at this fountain. And if you're drinking deep, what will be happening is you'll be rising up in your heart. And there'll be a hallelujah somewhere underneath your scalp. We're too regular, if you want, to, to say it out loud. But surely when you wonder just what God has provided and we've just dipped our toe away like Moses stepping into the Red Sea here you know holding out the rod dipping his toe into the water the Red Sea is going to open and we're going to see something of the marvelous grace of God verse 2 grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord those two words grace and peace are important grace was the normal Greek greeting. Peace, or shalom, as you might be more familiar with it, was the normal Jewish greeting. Grace meant everything good and beautiful happened in your life when it was used as a greeting. But we know that it's much more than that, even from what we've addressed already. By grace you are saved. Sorry. Yes, through faith. Get myself tongue-tied a wee bit there. By grace you are saved. And so the reference here is to, to, to the abundant goodness that God does to us. Do you remember what it was like to be an unbeliever? Madly drifting through life on the broad way leading to destruction. And somebody somewhere brought you this good news and God applied it to your life. Did you deserve it? No. Even the best among humans don't deserve it. I've said umpteen times one of the reasons we have the Old Testament is to show that even the most privileged and best of the individuals there, you know, Abraham is God's friend. David has a heart after God. They're fatally flawed and deserve judgment in themselves. Everybody who's a believer is a believer because God looks on us and he, he, he gives his son for us and then by grace brings us into the good of it. And what's the result? Peace. The Jews had that greeting and shalom means may everything in your world be in order and harmony. And again, it's ramped up in the Christian context. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Not just peace with our neighbours, but peace with God. We have been reconciled to him. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. We've been brought into this marvellous place like Psalm 23 describes. You know, the good shepherd has brought us beside the still waters, into the green pasture. He set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. God is for us. And that's where Peter wants these believers to be. He recognises you become a believer because of grace. That's why he's Simon Peter. But he then informs us 
that being a Christian is not a static thing. I get worried when people just want to tell me they became a Christian 40 years ago. And they, they seem to think because they've got the eternal insurance policy, then they can just free will for the rest of their days. That's not biblical. The biblical practice and pattern is that when grace enters your life, it then becomes a determining Stirring, motivating part in you. Philippians 2, isn't it? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you, both to will and to do. When God works in you, what happens is then you put yourself into gear and you begin to go forward with him. Peter says, may it be multiplied to you. Where does it come from? It's right there in front of you. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That word knowledge in the Bible is very important. This is everlasting life. John 17 verse 3. Knowing you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God's grace comes to us because of what Christ did and because of what he's doing. You know what our Lord Jesus is doing right at this minute in time. He ever lives to make intercession for you. He can see who you are, where you are, what's happening. He knows what you need in your life. And he's taking the merits of his sacrifice to his Father. And through that, by the Spirit, bringing you what you need to go on. Bringing you to that place. Where you're resting in and rejoicing over God's mercy, kindness and grace. In the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this verse I found really intriguing. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Notice again, through the knowledge of him. who called us by glory and virtue. Notice how knowledge keeps coming in. We're always learning. And, and some things we need to learn over and over. Verse 12 of this chapter has been a great encouragement to me as a preacher. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. Even though you've heard it before. The very act of hearing it again is God's means to bring about goodness and grace in your life. And that's why we preach the word in season and out of season. That's why we encourage Bible study. That's why we pray over this book. That's why we seek to live in obedience to Christ. Because the more we get to know him, the more we grow like him. There are two things in this knowledge. There's two kinds of knowledge, aren't there? There's what we might call academic knowledge and practical knowledge. You go to school and you learn how to do sums. Why? Is sums still the right word to use? Anyway, you know what I mean, you're of my generation. Why? It's so that when you do grow up and you've got pocket money, you can work out how much you've got. What you can afford, what you can't afford. When you go to work, you can actually be involved in, in business, working out their various parts. Learning the sums, the ten times table, is hard work and sometimes it's just dogged repetition. But later on down the line it becomes practical. You can see how it's in use and how it's a major part of your experience. Academic knowledge is always improved on by experimental knowledge. And that's what Peter is talking about. Not just knowing where to find it in the Bible. Not just being able to argue theology. But the faith which has the works, as Peter says, which shows that your faith is working. The second thing to pick up from this is this marvellous statement. As his divine power, notice past tense, has given to us. That means you've already got it. All things, not just some things, that pertain to life and godliness. Life is everlasting life, abundant life, godliness, godlikeness. It's that transformation of grace which, which shows you are holy. 
You've already got it. The best illustration I could find of it, it was a help to me, was that when a baby's born, although it's a helpless baby, it's already got within it, in its genes and its, its, its potential for growth, everything it needs to become an adult. So that God has already given us when you are born again by God's Spirit. His Spirit comes to dwell. His Word takes root in your life. And the Spirit and the Word together are God's provision for us to grow and go and be for His glory. Notice verse 4, all the mankind's rest away. I'm just going to be quick on it and come back next week. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world through lust. That last statement is, is talking about the fact you've been converted, you've been saved from the broad way. But do you notice what he said? How are we to grow in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not by going into a cave on a mountain and, 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 and sort of getting away from everything. It is, in fact, by the means of God's word. And it's described here as great and precious promises. I always remember, I think it's Spurgeon who, who talks about the promise box of faith and I've seen them sometimes when there used to be Christian bookshops, they would sell you a promise box and they, they were almost like these um, little bits of paper you get in Chinese crackers, you know what I mean? You, you, you get them and you, you all chuckle around the table except in God's promise box there's a promise about his presence with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. There's his promise that the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. There's the promise that he'll, he, his Holy Spirit has come to dwell. How many do I have to list? It depends how much time you've got. This promise box is full and it's yours. And the more you dip into it, the more you grow. All the promises of God, 2 Corinthians 1, or yes and amen. We're about in Christ Jesus. So as Peter begins this letter, he's pulling the Christians right back to where we must always be pulled back to. That is Christ. He's our Saviour. He's our Lord. He's the one who's commissioned us to be witnesses to the world. We'll never be apostles, but we are witnesses. And he encourages us to to, to, to get into that kind of personal relationship which binds you to him and him to you forever. Many of us here are married, perhaps, married, perhaps all of us. But you know, there's one special person in the world you know better than anybody else and they know you better than anybody else. There's lots of other individuals around and you might know something about them, but you don't have that full knowledge which Peter is speaking of here. And it always intrigues me. The Bible uses marriage as a picture of our relationship to Christ. We're his bride. He's the bridegroom. Don't wait until the wedding day to get to know him. Make it your business now, says Peter. And what you'll find is you'll be more than equipped to live a godly, holy life which brings glory to God. Are you ready for the week that lies ahead? I often fear I'm not. But I'm not going into it on my own. No matter where I go next week, he's there. No matter what I meet, what, what, what problems intrude into my life, I don't have to handle it just in my own strength, underneath of the everlasting arms. These are God's promises. And they bring power to live godly lives. I'm looking forward to the rest of Second Peter. I hope I've whetted your appetite. And maybe you could be reading ahead and digging into some of this stuff. May God bless it to us for his glory. Amen.